I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I'm going to be addressing a concern that someone had posting on the channel about that they were worried about Nicaragua not allowing gun ownership anymore and how this might affect them. So I want to dig into this a bit because there's a number of aspects to this that are really important. And I understand that a lot of my viewers live in America and they have a lot of very strong feelings about gun control. But it's important to understand that your feelings about gun control in America are very different when they play out when you are abroad. As an expat, some of the things that you think apply to gun control don't actually apply. And it's something that I think we need to discuss because there are a number of people, especially from the United States, who are looking at Nicaragua and they see the struggle to, the difficulties with, or the potential impossibility of gun ownership as being a major showstopper. I'd like to explain why that's probably not the case. We're gonna get to that right after the bump. In a recent episode, I talked about risk assessment and the importance of not saying what if, but working from statistics. All risk, all, without exception, comes from math. Now, we can't always generate perfect math, I understand, but we have really good statistics, logic, and information about a lot of things. And when we're doing serious risk assessment, because things that are really extreme, like what are the chances that a meteor is going to destroy the entire planet. No, we, we have a really difficult time coming up with statistics on that because we don't know how often it's going to happen because it's never happened before. It's done some damage, but it's never wiped out the entire planet in entirety. So we don't have a statistic on that. And even if we did a statistic that we're, we're that close to, that is so, uh, you know, one in a million kind of thing, doesn't become very useful because you, you simply can't do anything about it, right? And if it was to happen sometime soon, you could say, well, that's never going to happen. It's one in a million, but it's been maybe 999,000 years or one in a million still could happen any moment. So some of those things, there's just not a good, useful function to certain types of risk assessment. But when we're talking about normal things that are effective to talk about for safety, we have really solid math on these things. So that's important that anytime you're having a safety discussion, if you're having that discussion without the math, you're not actually having a safety discussion, you're having an emotional discussion. And that's how dangerous things happen. In fact, working without the math and just working from like, what if, like we said in the other video, is a way to try to work around known safety. Like you would only do that if you're either not approaching it from a safety perspective whatsoever, and it's just panic, or you're trying to ignore what you must know to be true, or you wouldn't want to ignore it. So I want to give a really important example, because someone said, well, Nicaragua taking away guns, which happened more than a half a decade ago, but the country used to have not a lot of guns, but it did have gun ownership as a relatively normal thing. It was fairly easy to get a gun. I wouldn't say easy and certainly expensive, but if it was something you really wanted, you could do it. Whereas in, say, Guatemala, it's relatively easy to have a gun even compared to Nicaragua. Panama has quite a few, but here in Nicaragua, we now have essentially no gun ownership. I don't know the exact law, but I do know that the people that you would expect to be most likely to have guns don't because they had them and they had to give them up. People who were doing things like marksmanship, right? Not not hunting, which you could see hunting, maybe laws would change and make hunting illegal, not for protection, those kinds of laws. Those are the kinds of things that people argue about and change through legislation over time. But things like marksmanship, just pure sporting uh, gun ownership, it, that those things are affected means that pretty much everyone uh, has probably had to give up their guns. Even the police, the police who wear blue, we call them the Celeste, they are not armed here in Nicaragua. They have a separate police force. It's not exactly analogous to SWAT in the United States, but if you were to make a comparison, that's more what it's like. They are armed, whereas the normal police are not. They wear black, just like SWAT teams. They typically have body armor, just like SWAT teams, but they're not exactly special forces. That is a separate thing, whereas SWAT normally is kind of a special force. Uh, so it's kind of an in-between, but that's not really relevant. But that's how even normal police that you will interact with are not armed. It's not something that they need to be able to do their jobs because they're they're just it doesn't provide the kind of protection that you would think that it would need. And in places like the United States, it totally does. It's a very different uh, uh, situation. So that the police are armed in the United States is a completely different discussion. But here, they just don't need it for safety. And they do have regular access to what we call the Negra or the police in black, which is kind of like SWAT. 
to come when they need them with guns. They're not far away. It's not like in the United States where you may not have a SWAT team in every town. Every town definitely has a group of the Negro, maybe very small. They do exist and they're there to back up the other police when needed. And there are situations such as road stop where there'll be someone from the Negro nearby just in case so they can react very, very quickly. Or if they're guarding an important building or something, then the Negro would actually be the ones that are there instead of the Celeste. So they, they are out there, but normal police that normal people will interact with other than nodding as you walk down the street are going to be the Celeste, the ones that arrest you at home, the ones that investigate a crime, the ones that do a traffic stop. All of those are unarmed. I want to come in and add a little bit of story to this because I have some anecdote that I think is really relevant to this particular story and references something I just said. And I've never told this story really on the vlog and so it's a good time to do it. So I wanna do a little preface and then I'm gonna do this story as an independent thing because then it's useful to have just in case I ever needed to throw onto other videos in the future. So I grew up in rural Western New York. This is an area that's very heavily populated with white-tailed deer and turkeys and a lot of things that you could hunt. And hunting was an extremely common pastime uh, in Western New York. And so growing up, hunting was a very normal thing that we had to be conscious of. And as a child, it was a constant warning. Oh, it's that time of year. It's not safe to play outside. You definitely can't go in the woods. But even being in the swimming pool or in the yard was dangerous because hunters would sometimes see movement in a yard and open fire from a long distance away. And while they're rarely a good shot, they were literally shooting at you if you were not careful in your own yard. And so being aware that hunters were willing to open fire at children in the yard was a normal thing growing up. And I was literally shot at at times. That actually happened. Uh, and and many people I know it happened to. I had a Spanish teacher who had, some, had a hunter shoot a chicken at her feet in her front yard, right? She was standing right there and they were willing to shoot with her standing there at her chicken. We always had to bring in the horses at certain times because hunters would shoot at our pet horses. Uh, so this is a normal thing. Like the fear of hunters was a very common thing. Western New York, while relatively rural, is heavily and evenly enough populated that there's essentially no place where it is actually reliably safe to discharge a weapon. So if you ever hear about gun safety or anything, anyone who had taken gun safety would avoid the entire region because essentially there's no place where you could safely fire off a shot and not think you might hit a person, even very heavily wooded areas. If you went out walking in the woods, which I did a lot as a child, you would encounter other people in the woods. It was a very outdoorsy kind of place. And so uh, even places that seemed extremely remote, places where you were sure you were alone, you could run into people uh, in those situations. And especially during hunting season, the number of hunters that were in the woods, regardless of the the civilian population, the hunting population in the woods was so heavy and so much trespass. And not that, not that they were breaking the law. Like a lot of cases, you're allowed to go onto a lot of land, but on land they don't own and don't know, right? So, so stumbling about on land they, they have no control over, you would often find hunters in very close proximity to each other with no idea that that was the case. So this is just the background, but to where I lived and, and how hunting was. And it was a, a constant stream of news about um, people that were out hunting and had terrible hunting accidents. You expected every season there to be a number of hunters who didn't make it uh, for reasons that were completely avoidable and for no logical reasons had been shot. But really importantly, it was always where people like hunting safety instructors or police officers who had never had an accident on the job would have a gunfight maybe with themselves. Really famously, I remember the, the best story was the sheriff who had never had a gun accident while working as a police officer, but on his day off, he went hunting, got wasted, and discharged his shotgun with his hand over the end of the barrel and completely blew his hand off, right? If you've ever held a shotgun, you don't casually shoot your own hand off with a shotgun. Your foot, maybe, but your hand, like the level of disregard for safety that a sheriff was willing to have. And so if you think about the level of gun training that police officers get and the level of gun training that, at least in New York, that anyone being allowed to hunt is supposed to have, both should have very much told him, right, oh, you can never mix a beer with this, ever, not a single beer, right? If you've ever heard of a hunter who's drinking, 
right? They're disregarding gun safety rules and generally breaking the law. So there's all these, all these really simple things, but we would hear this constantly. So we're very aware of just how dangerous hunters were. So when I was in high school, I had a gun safety uh, instructor who uh, worked with the, the hunting board or whatever, fish and wildlife, I'm sure, uh, in New York. And he was my, uh, they called him keyboarding instructor. He's my typing teacher. And we had a really terrible relationship, um, partially because I was a vastly better. Um, this is not very much of a flex. I started typing on a regular typewriter when I was five years old because my mother had a typewriter. And so I've always typed. When I was in elementary school, I typed papers. Of course, I'm older than computers in schools. We didn't have computers in schools. We didn't have access to typewriters, but it was a big deal. My, my teachers, when I was very young, they were always very happy when I typed up papers at home for reports or anything. And at, even when I was pretty young, because I had typed from so early, I found typing easier than writing. You know, I didn't get cramps when I typed, but I did when I hand wrote. So I would type a lot of things and they would often give me extra credit. So it was a great way. Um, it probably did take me a little bit extra effort, but it wasn't the amount of extra effort that you might think. And so I would use a typewriter and write a lot of reports. And by the time I was 11, we had a computer with a printer. And then I did that. And then it was vastly easier to use the computer. And they'd still give me extra credit for making it easier for them to read and making it not look nice and everything. So it was, it was totally what I did, always. So that by the time I was a junior or senior in high school and taking this ridiculous class that had made no sense, um, I was a, an extremely fast typer. I programmed all the time. That was my hobby. Um, I had worked as a programmer. Like, I typed so much that the idea that I had to take a typing class was so absurd, but they wouldn't let me out of it. And it turns out later I found out that this teacher just hated me, which we knew. Like, we hated each other. That was open. Um, but he knew I had tested out of the class, and he hid it from me so I would stay in the class so he could harass me, which was very foolish because I probably harassed him far more. But he intentionally threw away that, that time and used it to try to ruin my typing. He would force me to type poorly in the class to make me slower because I could out-type him by a lot. He was not a good typist. Um, he, so he was this horribly failed teacher. He was everything, antithesis of education in every possible way, and felt, I'm sure, a great deal of shame about his, his career and his job. But his hobby, and the only thing he cared about in the world, was hunting. And so every class, he used it as a platform for pushing hunting and gun ownership um, constantly. It was a constant discussion. And the entire class was, was always angry with him, and everyone would argue with him. And he was um, a huge proponent of, of just enjoying cruelty to animals, not hunting because he enjoyed the sport, hunting because he, he really liked killing. And um, he would brag about the safety and how you there's so much training and safety precautions that go into hunting that it's unreasonable for there to be accidents we're always like but but follow the news like we all know all of us know hunters who get hurt all the time like we live in rural western new york you can't pretend this is safe we all know it's not we we all have another class where the teacher was shot at half the students in the school have been shot at all of us have relatives who've been injured like but he would just lie and lie and lie. And the great thing about this story is at one point, and I would, you can guess, right, from the tone of, of my videos, there is no way I ever let it go in the class. I always brought up statistics. I always called him out on his lies. I never let him get away with it. And I, since I could outtype him, he also couldn't hold anything in the class over me. And this one time he went out for the weekend, and he was hunting with a partner, white-tailed deer hunting, as is the majority of hunting in Western New York. And while they're out hunting, his partner, he was up, my teacher was up in a tree stand. His partner was on the ground. His partner believed he had seen a white-tailed deer that climbed a tree, aimed up in the tree, and shot my teacher through the kidney uh, and sent him plummeting to the ground out of a tree stand. I think the worst moment of his life was not being shot through the kidney, but the fact that he survived and had to come back and teach and face me having been shot through the kidney by a person that he had trained in gun safety, that he had specifically sworn up and down, was so safe, somehow mistook him for a tree-climbing white-tailed deer, both misidentified that deers can climb, deer can climb trees, that he was a human, not a deer, uh, 
the number of things that have to go wrong for you to aim up in a tree with the person you're with. Look at your buddy that you went there with and pull the trigger and shoot them out of a tree is extreme. Whether they were drunk, on mushrooms, or just shooting wildly, they never admitted. But this is this is my this is my anecdote of of hunting the one time that someone really really <laughs> decided to have an argument with me about gun safety and uh, he did survive. Um, I have no idea if he's still alive. The thing, the activities that he partook in on a regular basis, um, it's unlikely that he has survived. He definitely ran with the most reckless crowds, but he was the perfect example of he was so adamant about the safety of guns. And he is the greatest example I've ever known of how could anything be safe when in a tree stand from a person standing at the bottom of the tree, only allowed to shoot at a deer, knew he was in the tree stand, knew he was a human, looked up, mistook him for a flying deer and shot him. There's no possibility of there being any degree of safety in this scenario, given how so many controls, it does, any logic, any, would have prevented that from happening. So it's the, he is now the greatest story I have ever heard for how dangerous guns can be and how the hubris, the act of saying guns are safe, I'm safe with a gun, tells you or suggests that the people who say it are, now this is anecdotal, but this is what you expect, right? Is absolutely the most dangerous people. The people who are safe with guns are the ones who don't pick them up because they know how dangerous they are and they don't use them for fun. They use them only when it's absolutely necessary. People who pick up guns because they think of their toys, because it's an enjoyable hobby, that's when dangerous things happen. Because, okay, so we just have to assume that guns have been taken away. Yes, there may be some extreme outlier situation where you're allowed to have a gun. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. I'm suggesting that we're pretty confident that even if the law technically allows for that, in practice, assume it does not. You cannot have a gun. What has this done in Nicaragua? Well, one of the most important things that it did is it increased safety across the country. Now, maybe that was the goal. Maybe that was not the goal. It's not really relevant. What we know is that Nicaragua had a relatively higher level of violent crime prior to the taking away of guns, not necessarily related, but probably there was a very tight correlation. And during that time, it was not dangerous like Honduras, was not dangerous like El Salvador, but it was more dangerous than the US for sure, right? It was, it was not bad, but it wasn't the best. It was nothing you would worry about. But now, since they took the guns away, safety has gone through the roof and it is now competing with Canada rather than struggling to compete with the US. Except for just in 2023, there was a slight anomaly that we don't expect to last. In general, Nicaragua is outrageously safe. Now, Americans, when they tend to come here, generally come from a situation of they're used to being afraid of everything and they feel like they have to protect themselves from things. And they feel like the police can't protect them, so they have to protect themselves. Now, whether that's true or not, it is an emotional feeling that is extremely common and just assumed to exist in the majority of American society. So Americans, when they travel abroad, often look for ways to arm themselves or to find some level of protection or seek out gated communities and other things because they don't feel that the normal level of safety, whatever that is, the baseline is adequate for them. And it comes from primarily a place of the United States is a relatively dangerous place compared to a Canada, compared to Nicaragua. And so when you live with the constant threat that your neighbors are armed, that the police are armed, that police might come to the wrong door, they're literally in some cases allowed to shoot you even though they're in the wrong house. You have to, like all kinds of really dangerous scenarios exist in the United States. And even though those things are pretty uncommon, they exist as real fears that people worry about all the time. And we worry about now mass shooters and things like that. And how do you protect against mass shooters? Well, you arm the populace, of course, right? If you're not going to take the guns away from the shooters, you have to arm everyone else. So, in the United States, for an individual who doesn't have an opportunity to go, you know, change things, right? We're not talking about someone who's in a position who can just go, well, we're going to change the law. No, assuming you're just an American and reacting to the situation around you, it makes sense that you would react by saying, well, I want to be armed because that is what little bit I can do on my own to an action, some form of safety for myself. 
But here in Nicaragua, we don't have those threats, right? We don't have armed police. They are not allowed to come to your house and shoot you. They're not allowed to do something to you if they're in the wrong house. That would be on them, not on you. Uh, you do not have mass shooters. None, like literally, there are none. It doesn't exist here, as in most of the world, it doesn't exist at all. Um, there's so many things that Americans are trying to protect against, including armed invasion, that Nicaragua doesn't really have. I'm not saying there's no armed invasion. That's a real thing that exists everywhere. But again, armed invaders in Nicaragua almost never are going to have a gun because having a gun here marks you as a criminal. If you got caught with a gun, you would have no way to claim you weren't the person that someone was looking for. And even if you weren't the criminal they were looking for, you're a criminal and they got you, right? And the other thing is, is that when you're in a home invasion, having a gun is the last thing you want as a homeowner. Now, if you live alone, you live far out in a farmland, right, you're completely isolated, having a gun, knowing that anything that's living in your house that you want to shoot is kind of a break even. But if you have any family members, any possibility of family members, any neighbors, any animals that might be in your house, or you're in a very small house, or you just want to be a little bit more effective, guns are not what works best for defending a house against home invaders. Machetes are. Machetes are cheap, really effective at close range. And I got this information from American police who told me, you know, if you're in close combat with a machete, you want to run away, right? Your gun is not going to protect you and American police do not carry machetes, right? So they don't have equal armaments. So if you have a gun and you're in a situation against home invaders here, if they have guns, you're still going to lose most likely because they are prepared. They know they're coming in. They know when they're going to be there. They know to have their gun ready. They know to have it at hand and they don't care who they're shooting in the house. If they accidentally hit some of your family members, they don't probably care. You do. Your job is to protect them, not put them in danger. So your gun, which could shoot someone accidentally, and the more someone says, no, well, I'm not going to shoot someone accidentally, that's exactly who shoots someone accidentally. The more you are concerned, oh, I'm really worried about having a gun, I might shoot someone accidentally, that makes you most likely not to because you're also less likely to pull the trigger. But in a situation where you're trying to defend your family, you need the ability to act very quickly, be very threatening, and be effective. And machetes work much better in a household-style combat. Now, you're, if you got into an open field and you're chasing someone and you're trying to stop them from getting away, yes, then a gun is more effective. But that's not about your safety at that point. At that point, it's about vengeance or maybe justice. And that's fine. That's not a bad thing. But if your goal is to protect your family, to keep yourself safe, having a gun both logically and statistically, doesn't work that way. Now, when we were talking about uh, the what-if scenarios, we talked about statistics, and we talked about why you become emotionally tied to control and why this is dangerous. So I want to give the same example we gave there, which is flying. When we fly in an airplane, we let the pilot who is trained, we know they're awake, they're monitored, they're controlled, there's all kinds of mechanisms to keep pilots doing what they're doing, including redundancy. When you're driving your car, there's no one that can reasonably reach over, take the wheel, and drive for you. To some degree, there's a little bit of that maybe, but not really. It's not the same as having a separate wheel and being able to completely take over control and deal with anything. But in an airplane, commercial airplane, you have full redundancy of the people controlling the plane. And you also tend to have enough time that someone who's not in the cockpit could come up, take over controls, and regain control. You also have really good autopilots. And while Tesla likes to Pretend that there is good self-driving in the United States. There's some great videos out there demonstrating why there absolutely isn't. And the idea of self-driving cars is something we do not even have close yet. Someday, for sure, but not today. But airplanes do fly themselves. They'll even land themselves in most cases. So you, you have so much redundancy in an airplane. And what's important about that is that if what you're concerned about is safety, Getting your family from point A to point B without something tragic happening to them, a plane is so much safer than driving. And it doesn't matter how good of a driver you are, and it doesn't matter how good of a driver you think you are. Because things like a tire blowing, I just saw a video of someone who flew their car in the air because a truck next to them lost a tire and in under a quarter of a second, it went from on the truck to flipping the car next to it. They happened to walk away, everyone survived, but that type of accident, which is so dramatic, could easily have killed many people on the road, was completely uncontrollable. No human could have made that safer. And no person, is the same thing happened in the sky, but the difference is airplanes don't tend to have those kind of situations, but cars tend to, just because they're on the ground. If you moved planes around at high speed on the ground, they would be dangerous too. Partial Part of their safety comes from being in the air, part of it comes from the radar installations. It's not that 
flying is inherently safer than driving. If you had no other vehicles on the road, of course, cars would be safer. But that's not the real world. We're talking about going on highways and dealing with other drivers. And so statistically, we know that it's not even close. It's not even in the ballpark. Now, trains and planes are in a relatively similar ballpark. Planes squeak by is a little bit safer, but you can reasonably take a train and it's approximately the same safety. But driving in a car is extremely dangerous compared to either. And we get these things. We feel when we're in a car that we have control. And when we're driving, I'm sorry, and when we're flying, we give up that control. But giving up the control is what makes us safer. We can't have the level of control that makes us feel good and be safe. The two, just they're oil and water in that scenario. Guns work a lot like this. And Nicaragua, while it just went through it, is a great example. But lots of other countries have done the same thing, the UK being a popular example. They went through a situation where guns created a great degree of uh, uh, public outcry over safety concerns. They took away all the guns and immediately safety went sky high. So that's an example a lot of countries have looked to that a very large country with a very large number of guns out there was able to practically overnight collect them all change the laws and change their safety concerns just like that. And it can be done anywhere. If they can do it, places like the United States certainly can as well. And any concern that you have that they can't actually is a reason why they need to. The more you're concerned that it would be difficult, that is just stating how important it is to do because anything that would make it difficult is a reason you got to take the guns away, right? Because you're worried that you believe that the people who have guns are going to use them for nefarious purposes. That fear that taking them away could be hard is the acknowledgement that there's a problem that the wrong people have guns and they are being used currently, not could be, but are being used for bad purposes, specifically threatening the populace and threatening democracy. You can't vote for the things that some people want because they believe other people will become violent and are currently threatening them with that possibility. And that is not just something people kind of feel, but it affects how people vote. That means the vote is literally being affected by threats of violence. So that's the very important things to understand. But the demonstration that Nicaragua has done is that in taking away the guns, the safety got better. So what has happened is, yes, there's a certain amount of giving up control. By having a gun of your own, you have a certain amount of control or more importantly, the illusion of control. You do decide when the trigger gets pulled. You do decide when it becomes unholstered, but other people don't. And so the control of when you are going to pull a trigger, yes, you get, but the control of what other people are going to do with all their guns, you lose. And so your percentage of control is much smaller than the control you give up. So even the idea of control is completely an illusion. So you're not actually weighing control versus giving up control. You're weighing the illusion of control with the illusion of giving up control. And so what they've demonstrated, what many countries have demonstrated, is that by having a government that is looking out for its people, that is taking away the guns and taking decisions out of the hands of individuals with weapons and putting it into the government and saying people need to be less dangerous, just in general, across the board, taking the danger of individuals down, has increased safety. And so this is just like the pilots. The government is acting as the pilot here. And they have all kinds of legal controls. They have all kinds of... And then, okay, so I know a lot of people, especially Americans, are going to, and this is the rhetoric given in the United States specifically, to trick people. They say, well, freedom, you have to be free. Okay, so we can discuss at nauseum whether or not that's true in the United States. The quick answer is, oh, it's an obvious propaganda to control the populace. But regardless... If you are coming to another country, any other country, as an expat, you can never use concepts like I'm going to use weapons to defend my freedom. And this is what was said in the comments. Not that they said they were going to defend their freedom, but they said when you take guns away, you take away people's freedom, which is not demonstrable anywhere in the world. We can show that places like the United States live in fear. Democracy is subverted because people are afraid of violence of the people who have guns. So we can demonstrate just from that statement that there is a group of people who have lost their voice, that democracy has failed because people have guns. So that we know. That's that's proven, right? That's, that's black and white. So that it defends freedom is exactly exactly what it doesn't. It threatens freedom. That's a known thing. Now, it may not, when people start defining freedom as their ability to threaten others or to make others feel uncomfortable because they have weapons, okay, but that's not what freedom means to any rational person. That is the anti-freedom, right? Taking people's freedoms away is not the definition of freedom for anybody. That's just not how the language works. But the idea, now in America, the idea, 
right? Let's, let's just be honest, right? The idea of freedom by having guns is that what if the government or some group that maybe represents a government or government-like group and they want to determine certain things through force, well, the populace has the ability to rise up and defend itself. It's an admirable concept. And when America was founded, governments didn't have a lot of really powerful military. I mean, they did, but it's the, the degree to which the military was more powerful than a militia or a, you know, a farmer with a couple guns was minimal. The degree to which they're different today is astronomic, right? It, it's if uh, fully armed American soldiers up against a farmer they pretty much can just walk right up to them while the farmer is shooting at them and disarm them even if they didn't have a gun, right? Like the amount of body armor, the amount of weaponry, the amount of sophistication, the training, there's so much that the farmer doesn't have. And so the idea that the farmer, that a thousand farmers are gonna rise up and defend something against the military is a farce. But it did make sense at one point when the country was founded, on farmers rising up, banding together, being supported by their local governments, and not paying their taxes to the government that had defended them previously. So the country was founded on this idea that we need lots of weapons because outside forces may be invading us, and that the personal ownership of weapons, which were needed in many cases because people were living on farms, they were hunting, like they needed it for lots of reasons, not for recreation, not for self-defense, but for all these other things, that they needed those because guns were not useful for self-defense in that time period. That is a recent thing that you could use them in that way. They had this idea that we could defend our national freedom because you couldn't easily overthrow a populace that was well-armed. That's very legit, but that has changed and that no longer applies in any way, shape or form. It is so far from being true. If anything, it would be a simple argument and very rational to say by having an armed populace, you give the military an excuse to claim anybody is a threat. And we see this play out all the time. Why are police so quick to pull a trigger? Because they always say, well, I thought they had a gun. You can't say that in a populace where no one has a gun. Well, there's no reasonable way they could have had a gun. You can't just act that way. But in America, where everybody practically has a gun, there's exceptions, but almost everyone does. It is reasonable to say, well, I had a reason to believe that they had a gun. Yeah, you sure did. They were there. What are the chances they didn't have a gun? It's like saying I had the reasonable belief they had a shirt on. Nope, oh, yep, there's a chance they didn't, but they probably did, right? So, so it completely changes those things. And so we already see it playing out, so you can't, you can't think that, no, that couldn't happen. We know it happens. It happens every day. It's constantly in the news. This is a thing that Americans are very afraid of, and we've created this by arming so much of the population, we have told the military the population is a threat to the country, and you never know when they're going to rise up, when they're going to break the law, when they're going to attack the military, when they're going to attack the government. And people say things like, we're here to defend our freedom. Defend them from whom? Right? To which group do you plan on rising up, taking up arms, and firing upon that you are defending freedom? If an outside enemy invades, that is not going to be something that is done, right? You're not going to be able to fight off an, an invading army by having farmers with guns. You are not going to uh, convince the, the federal government that the people that were voted for should be shot because you don't like them, right? There's just, there's so many, that there's no sensible person. So when we say this, it sounds good. We're here to defend freedom, but England is not going to come and try to take over the country again. And if they did, the military will stop them, not the farmers. So the entire idea that you're going to defend freedom doesn't make sense. If anything, it takes away freedom. We know that it takes away individual freedoms, but it also takes away societal freedom. It absolutely, positively, on a dramatic scale, undermines freedom, which is why Americans are stuck saying freedom so many times. The word has to come out of everyone's mouth nonstop because there's such a lack of freedom in the United States that they have to focus on convincing everyone that they are free and convincing them that things that aren't actually very important as far as freedom goes, like freedom of speech and freedom of the press, both exist, which they don't. It's demonstrable. The United States is famously the country that oversees the killing of journalists around the world. We just saw the United States and its partners killing journalists in the Middle East in the last few weeks. This is a standard thing. People live in abject fear of the United States. If they are a journalist, they, as long as you're inside the United States, you're probably pretty safe. But the moment you're reporting on American activities or American allied activities abroad, you are directly in the line of fire. That is anything but freedom of the press. It is the absolute antithesis of antithesis. It is the absolute antithesis of it. And so the United States is the, is the world enemy, not the only one, but a major world enemy to journalism. 
And freedom of speech is often promoted because the ability to say things sounds really important, and it's not a bad thing on its own, but it is often used to create propaganda. It is used as an excuse for allowing false information to be disseminated, and it is used to give the impression, the illusion, that there is a freedom where you can speak your mind and that people will hear you. But the thing in the United States is that they have taken away the mechanisms for your voice to get out, They've made it so that your voice is essentially irrelevant. Not completely. It's not 100% or it would not be effective. But it is effective enough that people feel they have the power of voice. But routinely we know that people say, but there's nothing I can do. I can't enact change. And if you had true freedom of expression, it feels like, well, you should be able to enact change. But that's probably not true. But countries that are more worried about freedom of expression generally are feeling that way because people have the power to enact change. And so they need to worry about false information. They need to worry about malicious information. They have to worry about foreign involvement from manipulating their countries. So that's not always the case, right? There's lots of reasons why people have different laws. But we would expect in a country that is truly free, part of the mechanism of giving them the power to have a free democracy or anything similar to it requires a lack of freedom of expression rather than the existence of it because we can demonstrate over and over and over again that when given the power to lie, that the government can do so with so much volume and can control the volume of its competitors to make anything that they want seem like reality. And I'm not saying that there's a giant conspiracy. I'm saying that, that logically these are mechanisms that will be used in these ways. It doesn't require conspiracy. It just requires normal what's best for me logic and it's going to play out. So all of that, all of that to explain when you come to another country, the idea that you can defend freedom simply doesn't apply as an expat, as a tourist. Even if you're allowed to have a gun, you are never allowed to just pick up that weapon and decide to use your personal weapon as a tool for determining the government of another country. That is quite, act, quite, quite literally an act of war on that country. And while, yes, some people do do that, it is universally illegal and frowned upon. Uh, that is... But that's literally what many Americans feel that they're going to do. They're going to move abroad. They're going to bring weapons with them or buy them there. And that, and somewhere in the back of their minds, I'm not saying that they're consciously thinking this, but they are taught that they can go anywhere in the world, pick up arms, and personally decide through, through violence what should be the government of another place, which is fundamentally an attack on democracy, right? Saying that, well, whatever the people of this place decided on, as a government, I'm going to carry weapons and potentially overthrow that. Now, people may overthrow their own governments, right? There's a difference between defending your own country and making decisions internally and external people coming in, bringing weapons and waging war against them or with them in either case. But that is fundamentally what we're talking about is people who are saying or having in the back of their minds that they're going to use their weapons. And not only is it, is it questionable, but it's also this concept of control. Right. One of the reasons that coming to, in this case, Nicaragua, but this could apply to any place that you're interested in going to, one of the reasons that when you go there, that you, you want to go there, is the results of what they have decided. Right. So here in Nicaragua, you have a great degree of freedom. That freedom doesn't and has not come from Americans coming down here with a, with a handgun and keeping it in their house. That has not created the freedom that exists here today. The freedom that cre exists here today comes from any number of cultural, historic, legal, governmental actions over the course of the history of the country and possibly even older than the history of the country, those things over time have created the freedoms that people seek out and come here for. And so we know that what they're doing, what they've been doing has worked at least to the degree that it attracts you here fundamentally. Now, in order to maintain that, one of the things you need to do logically is not try to get involved, but to simply enjoy the fruits of their labor enjoy that they have come to the ends, the means have been accomplished, and the ends are things you want. You are leaving, in this example, America, because it doesn't have the freedom you want, because it doesn't have the safety that you want. You come to Nicaragua because it offers those things. But you should be thinking of it in terms of they're like pilots. Nicaragua has a track record of flying the plane, keeping people safe, keeping people free. Everybody has you know, bumps along the way. There's turbulence in every place. Right? But their track record and their current situation is really, really good. So that's why you want to come here, presumably. 
And the reason you want to leave the United States is because their track record isn't good and their current situation isn't good. Now, maybe there's other factors that are driving you here, right? Weather, cost of living, there's, there, it's more than just this one simple thing. But when we're looking at these things, you can't come and say, well, but I want to have guns. Well, but if you got to have guns, obviously, a lot of people would say, well, if I was the only one, okay, I get it. But assuming that it requires that everyone would be allowed to have guns, it means you're changing the whole situation and saying, okay, well, I know this has resulted in what I like, but I'd like to change the things that create the results. And in this particular case, very illogically, right? Nicaragua is safe. Nicaragua is free. United States is not as safe, not as free. But I want to do what America does here for the reasons of becoming like Nicaragua. But Nicaragua is already like Nicaragua. And the United States has problems. Now, you can argue that the guns are not what's creating those problems in America. And there's some solid arguments why it isn't. There's some really good arguments as to why it is or one of many factors that leans in that direction. But that's fine. But taking what is not working somewhere else and bringing it to where things are working for the goal of making things work the way that they're already working doesn't logically make sense. You're getting onto the plane. You don't walk into the cockpit and say, look, I know these pilots have kept everyone safe and the processes have worked, but I drove a car here and that was really dangerous. I only had a minor accident, but to keep everyone on this plane safe, I'm going to fly it. I don't know how to fly, but I'm going to fly it. Well, that doesn't make any sense because your track record or the track record of drivers is poor and you're not trained to fly the plane and the people who are flying the plane have a good track record. So why would you disrupt those things if those things have created the situations that have driven you out of one place and into another place? And so this is, I understand, people have an emotional reaction on one side, like control, having a gun, doing these things, it feels like you're in control. And on the other side, the United States, both culturally and through many political organizations, tries to use propaganda to convince people that they need to have guns for exactly the things that are a problem, right? By making people feel unsafe, by making people feel like they have to have guns, by making people feel like they will somehow be able to defend themselves with those guns, that they will enact freedom by carrying weapons. And it gives the government a lot of control. It gives them a lot of excuses. It allows them to, one of the most powerful things a government can do is make people live in fear and start to act emotionally. The more fearful and emotional a populace is, the more the government has absolute control over them in the ways that really matter. Their ability to ma manipulate voting, to manipulate public sentiment, to make those who would potentially speak out and do something feel that they can't, that they would be in danger, not from the government in their minds. What you want is people to fear their neighbors. They can't blame all their neighbors. And it becomes a, well, I don't know which neighbors, but I do know a lot of these people around me could be violent against me. And it's true. And we see it every day. And the government really wants that from a control perspective, because it's a really powerful way to just have a very powerful government without having to actually take away discrete freedoms, allowing the people to give them up voluntarily. And so we want to look for ways that uh, uh, we can we can get the, the pilots that we want, that we can get on the airplane that we want, that we can get the track record that we want. And logically, we don't need to have guns here. Probably don't need to have them in America, but it's a different scenario. But you don't need to have the illusion of control. The reasons that you want to come to Nicaragua are because it works, because the actual control is where you want it. The actual safety for you and your family is here. If safety was your concern, guns don't come into it. How you become safe isn't the primary concern, that it is safe. That's the primary concern. So you do the things that make you safe. You get yourself into the situation that is safe. You get yourself into the situation that is free. That's what's important. How it's done might be interesting. It might be a lesson for other places to improve. And there are places that are better than Nicaragua that we could learn from, I'm sure. But situations are different, right? There's not necessarily always the ability to simply replicate what's done somewhere else. And America makes a huge argument for that, right? Sure, every country that's taken away guns has successfully done so and become safer, but it won't work here, right? Maybe it won't. But the idea that it's the exception to every rule is unlikely, but it is the argument that is made. And so that, yeah, that could exist. But you do have to look at what works, learn from it, but trust the pilots, the idea that you're going to grab the illusion of control, take that over, undermine the things that have worked for the exactly the opposite reasons. It just doesn't make sense. So it's another way of looking at it. gun ownership, why guns are taken away, why when you're looking at Nicaragua, you can't 
rationally say that you're worried about them not having guns because you know that them not having guns has worked. You know that the things that you would be concerned about, the reasons you would want guns, aren't things you have to worry about here. Maybe because they have guns, maybe not because they don't have guns, right? We don't know why it works, but what we know is that it's working. And so if you're in a place where those things are scary and you're coming to this one because it's not, you don't want to change the thing that might be making it not scary. It's just not, that, that can't be the reason. So think about what your goals are. And hopefully your goals are safety for your family, safety for everyone else. Freedom is a good thing to want in general. Those are reasons to consider Nicaragua over many places that you may go. It's not number one in most things, but there's lots of amazing places around the world that do a good job with that, but a lot of them are a lot more expensive. Uh, but Nicaragua does a pretty good job. And one of the reasons that people want to be here is exactly those things. So think about the end result, the goals. And I think you'll find that having guns and, and worrying about whether or not you're allowed to have one and the desire to have one don't really fit with those healthy goals. And sure, owning guns can be really fun. Some people are really passionate about it. And that can be super unfortunate, especially if you're like a gun sportsman and you're like, well, but I really want to do sharpshooting. I really want to go hunting. And those are the things that you may not be able to do here. If those are goals, if those are things that are really important to you, yes, those are things you have to consider. But if your goal is using guns for safety, using guns for freedom, that doesn't hold water. It's not a viable reason as to why you would want a gun and not a viable reason why you'd be concerned about here. The answer, if those things are things you want, you should say, I'm so relieved that whatever Nicaragua has done has worked and I'm glad to be able to go there because it's safer and more free. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, post on social media, tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And I'll pop up on the screen four old episodes. Go click on one, watch it, let it play in the background. I'd really appreciate it.